give it a few seconds for everybody to connect to audio. Sure. Okay, how do you think we're going there, Peter? Do you think we've got everyone in now? I, I think so, but there'll probably be some latecomers and people coming in and out during the meeting. So I'll keep an eye on that for you. Okay, thanks very much. No problem. Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to the Machine Observations Interest Group meeting today. I am going to share my screen and uh, start walking us through the um, inevitable logistics. Okay. So in Australia, we usually start our uh, public meetings with an acknowledgement of country or acknowledgement of our traditional owners. And uh, I have quite a big list because I cover my head office and um, where I'm working today. So I, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people as the traditional owners of the land where ALA's head office is located. The Boon Wurrung and Woi Wurrung or Wurrungi people of the Greater Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land of my workplace and my home where I speak to you from today. Myself and my employers acknowledge their continuing uh, connection to their culture and pay our respects to elders past and present. Okay, so for our meeting today, uh, I've got roughly, um, my name's Peggy Newman, by the way, I'm from the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, I'm the convener of this group and uh, we set this group up in 2018, I think, at the Tadwood meeting. Uh, so hi and welcome. Um, this is our annual meeting. Um, I'm the moderator today. The co -mod our co-moderator is uh, Peter Desmet and um, we've got members of our core group here. And um, we're very grateful for the tech support we're getting today from um, Peter Huybritz and Jocelyn Pender. So the format of today is uh, gonna be this run through. Um, we'll try to give lots of opportunities for discussion and questions all throughout. Uh, we've got um, a background presentation on the core group and our charter and uh, what we're trying to do here. Uh, we'll run through our, our GitHub repository um, where we're uh, working on some projects on applying Darwin Core to biologging data and uh, we'll open up for general discussion. So we'd really like to hear from you. Um, we've got both the chat here, which is invisible to me at the moment, I think. Um, and uh, there's a link to the Google Docs, which um, the guys will uh, add to the chat imminently throughout the, um, throughout the session. Uh, you can raise your hand in Zoom if you'd like to say something, and uh, we'll be asking for questions along the way. So the session is being recorded. Um, you're very welcome to use or not use video. Uh, please keep your microphones muted if you're not speaking. Uh, we'll be trying to um, pause throughout the discussion to let people who might not always jump in to contribute. Um, so don't be alarmed if there's a little bit of a little bit of dead air. Feel free to participate basically in any way uh, that works best for you. Uh, if you're having bandwidth issues, maybe turn on, turning off your video might help. Um, and there's the different views you've got up in the top right hand corner of Zoom. Like you can see either the active speaker or you can see a gallery view of uh, quite a few people at once. Uh, my co-hosts here have the ability to mute participants. Um, we've got the 
chat function here and that's available for technical questions or conversing with other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any nefarious or in inappropriate use of chat might result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. So we've got a code of conduct document that's there in, um, there's a link to it in the, um, in the Google Doc. Please bear with us if we have any technical difficulties. Um, we've got people here who will help us out if there's a total failure and we'll call everyone back in. So does anyone have any questions at this stage about, uh, about the session and how we're going to run? No? Okay. Uh, so I'd like to offer a warm welcome to the Machine Observations Group Interest Meeting. But before we start, I thought maybe I could um, get a couple of people to throw into the chat um, an answer to my quick little question here. What, what are some of the types of data you think of when you hear the term machine observations? So we've got our experience that we've brought to it, but what, um, what sort of things do you think about when you think of machine observations? That would be interesting to know. Uh, I can't see the chat, so I can't respond to that just at the moment. So I'll have to ask my co-host to look out. So thanks for coming. Um, these are pretty unusual times. Um, it's disappointing not to be meeting in person this year, but it's um, a really good opportunity to have some of you along who we don't usually see. Um, our group's had a fairly inactive year uh, in terms of meetings and this is a good time for us to catch up and um, catch up with each other and discuss the work we've been doing, what's been happening in our institutions, etc. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can get um, a good opportunity to get a lot of feedback from um, from you and yourselves, um, from new people and uh, ask questions and maybe tell us some of your data stories. So our group um, started, uh, our group started with the motivation to discuss and document uh, common approaches to the modelling exchange and publication of biodiversity data derived from sensors. Um, there's a link there and that's all the way through our materials to our, to our group charter. Um, if you'd like to go and have a look. What are machine observations? Well, machine, uh, arguably they're observations inferred from sensor data. Some examples um, include radio telemetry, GPS tracking, Doppler shift, solar geolocation, acoustic telemetry, camera traps, acoustic monitoring, video monitoring. So um, the basic model is where we have a sensor and an animal and a, um, and a deployment where the sensor captures some sort of information about uh, usually the animal. The context of this type of data is essential um, to, to, to understand the nature of the data. So the, the deployment information, experimental design, uh, operational settings, algorithms and parameters um, that are used to, in the processing of the data and quality control are all really important aspects of this data that need to come along with it. It's a really exciting area of um, data capture of science. Um, um, at the moment, devices are getting smaller. Um, there's a lot of manufacturers in the sector. Batteries are lasting longer and data sets are getting bigger and bigger. So we started the, um, we started the group, um, the, the, the activities we've got on our charter rather are to oversee task groups. Um, the job of an interest group in Tadwick is to oversee task groups that document common approaches for data exchange formats. Um, we wanted to provide a point of contact for the community to um, facilitate discussion on um, modelling these types of data scenarios, biologging camera traps and others that may arise, and, um, and also on publishing in biodiversity infrastructures um, and how that might work. Um, I did a bit of, um, I got out the uh, ALA and R uh, GBFR packages um, this week and had a look at uh, a, a, did a comparison of some of the um, the basis of record proportions of record based on basis of record and what um, 
what we're finding here is that um, machine observations still form a fairly small uh, proportion of the records um, in both ALA and GBIF. And um, I'm the, I've been acting in the role of data manager at the ALA this year, and I'm really, really hoping to uh, make that green bit get a lot bigger at some stage over the next couple of years. Uh, we started out um, uh, from uh, a meeting with Obis, I think, you know, a, a few years ago, um, where we wanted to produce these recommendations for fitting um, machine observations to Darwin Core. We, um, and we're still working on that to some extent, where uh, we started using uh, the Obis event data schema, um, and there's links to that over in our um, in our GitHub repository that we'll talk about later. Using that schema as a guide, um, um, we thought that this was a good place to do this because um, in, in Tadwig we have the informatics expertise of, um, of the Tadwig community and um, quite a few of us in the core group are also involved with the International Biologging Society and the Biologging Society can help us um, obtain that community consensus from um, the, the research community. Biologging Society, the International Biologging Society was formed in 2016 um, uh, at one of their meetings and they formed a constitution with a, a clause in it to progress standardization of data protocols used within the biologging community with a view to making databases interoperable. Uh, so they're very interested in um, the work that we're doing and I believe we've got some people from there to, uh, coming along to the meeting today. But I can't see anybody, so I'm feeling, <laughs> feeling, a bit, um, feeling a bit lonely here in my lounge room. So that's the overview so far um, for, um, for the group uh, without going into too much depth. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have to find a way to see the chat. There we go. You can't click the chat button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, Find your menu at the top of your screen under options. Here's my menu at the top. There's a, there's a little button that says chat, a little drop down menu and it'll say chat, I think. At the top here? I Thank think you, so. Deb. Uh, yeah. Here we are. Yeah, Got good. it. That's great. Okay. Oh, look, it's been very busy. <laughs> um, okay, so um, did anyone notice any, do we have any questions at the moment to, to bring up about the group itself? Uh, no, so far no questions from the group. This is Peter Desmet speaking. Uh, many answers to the question, what is machine observations for you? And some very interesting ones. Cool, anything interesting stand out to you, Peter? Well, that camera traps definitely seem to be uh, a part of machine observations. I think in the biologging group, they're sometimes uh, not considered uh, part of that, but at least for machine observations, definitely. And then a lot of uh, I would say non-animal observations, but more um, like um, what you would put in measurement or facts. Yeah, environmental environmental yeah, exactly. observations. Yeah, and there's some interesting. Um, there's an interesting answer here about um, machine learning image recognition, which I think um, we haven't really talked about all that much. But um, there's overlap there with the idea that you. Um, that we may need to use, uh, you know, find ways to describe algorithms um, that are used to determine species uh, identifications and those sorts of things. Okay, so that's great. That's really, um, that's really interesting. Thanks very much for that, everyone. Uh, what I might do now is move on to our 
introducing our core group, and we might start with you, Peter. Um, but while we um, while we progress, there's about six of us or seven of us. Um, but uh, while we go through, if there is anybody um, online who would like to introduce themselves and tell us a bit about themselves and the work that they're doing, raise your hand and uh, we'll get round to you. But Peter, Peter Desmet, would you start it off? Start us off today. Uh, yes, I'm Peter Desmet. I work at the Research Institute for Nature and Forest, or INBO, in Brussels. And I'm involved in uh, the LiveWatch project, for which we have a couple of sensor networks. And I presented this as Tedwick uh, last year. I'm going to add in the chat the link to the presentations that I made then. But I'm generally interested in, um, yeah, in this uh, interest group for the three types of data I have to publish as open data, because that is one of the aspects of libraries, the data must be open data. And that is GPS tracking data, um, there's camera trap data, and there's acoustic telemetry data for fish. And what I've discovered is that I was a very big fan of GBIF at the time, and I still am. So I thought, yeah, I'm just going to publish this data to GBIF as Darwin Core. And then I actually discovered that our existing standards and platforms and repositories to publish this data. So this has been a bit of a discovery where one, I've noticed that not all the information that is related to this type of data can be published in Darwin Core. Um, so I'm now more involved in, in community standards around a specific type of machine observation data, but I would still very much like this data to be aggregated in some way or harvested in some way as just generic uh, biodiversity occurrence data, and then to have this mapped to uh, what GB for OPE is ever using, which is Darwin Core. Um, but yeah, along this process, I've discovered that it might be good to publish the data in a closer to original format, but still standardized, like the move bank attributes uh, dictionary. Uh, and then from that, map that data to Darwin Core. Cool, thank you. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, perspective on ma on managing Darwin Core and um, publishing, you know, the original data set versus the occurrence data set and, uh, in Darwin Core. Does that um, mean to you that um, it, it, that really offers the discoverability um, yeah, to exactly. the data set, really? Is that, do you find that researchers are really receptive to that? Yeah, well, I, I think it's um, more, uh, if there is a very good community standard out there that is being used, we shouldn't force the people to publish their data into in Darwin Core, but as a smaller group we, uh, of, of repositories of this type of data, um, it would be nice if that type of data can be harvested by the bigger uh, initiative and infrastructure such as GBIF. So, and my, my interest here is in these three types of data, camera traps, acoustic telemetry, and GPS tracking data. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. That's really great. John, uh, would you like to go next? Um, did you want, did you have a couple of slides to share? Yeah, I got some nice animal pictures. I feel they go to waste other, if I didn't share my screen, so I'll give it a shot. Great. You usually have sharks, yeah. Oh, sometimes. I love sharks. Let's get Zoom to behave here. And... All right, how is that, everyone? That's good, thanks. So I'm John Pai. I'm the Director of Data Operations for the Ocean Tracking Network. Uh, we're a global infrastructure network that's funded by the Canadian Foundation for Innovation. We're headquartered at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, we've been operating since 2008, and what we do is deploy thousands of acoustic listening stations and other ocean monitoring equipment in key locations with partners around the world. Uh, so we establish partnerships with uh, regional and national stakeholders to document the movement of aquatic animals across a changing ocean. So the knowledge that we collect with our partners uh, it gets used by policymakers, industry, indigenous, coastal communities, and the general public. And the listening stations that we deploy, they pick up these uniquely coded tags that let us identify individual animals as they come within range of the borings. This is acoustic telemetry. 
Um, it's not very expensive, as Peggy was alluding to, uh, so it gets used in a broad range of species that are either ecologically or economically interesting to people and can observe animal movements across immense spatial and temporal scales. So these biologgers can be anywhere from a little coin or a, a large drink bottle, and they can vary with the intended target species. Uh, so larger tags can include things like oceanographic sensors that'll measure in situ conditions or tags with internal storage that will create this complementary time series that will send that over satellite or keep for instrument recovery. Uh, at OTN, most of our data sets are acoustic telemetry. So those pinging tags uh, get decoded by the specially made listening devices that I showed you a picture of earlier. Um, so we derive animal presence from this data. Uh, the tags that get embedded into the species have unique codes that let us identify exactly which animal was there. Uh, and so we deploy these uh, listening stations to create these gates or grids of detection and we pick them up with mobile platforms or the stationary platforms, uh, or, or the tags that run by. Um, so later we offload them from our listening stations. We build this picture um, of where the animals were in space and time. Uh, and we marry that up to either satellite or radio telemetry data if there are co-deployments, because often uh, people will deploy uh, multiple tags on an animal. Uh, currently we've got around 900 partner scientists tracking 75,000 individual animals across 255 different species in 42 countries. Uh, that comes out to 186 million animal detections as seen on about 20,000 uh, instrument deployments over the last 15 years. Uh, so we express this data once it gets cleared to be published in a lot of different formats. We do it via AirDAP on GeoServer, but we're also a thematic OBIS node that hosts uh, IPT with aquatic animal tracking data from projects around the world. And so you'll find us there. And uh, I did also have a picture of the uh, inaugural meeting because it was actually OBIS that set a lot of us on a path to, to create this greater standardization of, of biologging data. So this is all of us at a workshop that was held in Ustend by uh, the OBIS headquarters. So um, I'm really glad that we've carried this forward uh, under the aegis of, of TEDWIG to try, to try to iron out how best to express uh, this data. So that's all I've got. Cool, thanks, John. Yeah, one of the... Um... One of the things I was thinking about was with OBIS um, when I did my uh, charts this week, I thought, oh, I don't know how to get OBIS's, uh, you know, the volume machine observations that are in OBIS. Um, so yeah. I might hit you guys up later to try and do that and have a look at it. I'm, I'm dying um, to make that graph, yeah. <laughs> I don't think they've got basis of record through the API, but um, we can see what we can do a bit later. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Abby, would you go next? Yes. Hi, I'm Abby Benson. Um, I'm with the US Geological Survey. I don't have any uh, pretty pictures of charismatic megafauna like John did, but uh, um, I am the node manager for uh, GBIF and OBIS uh, in the United States and um, I mostly come at this from the uh, perspective of trying to get more data mobilized so that we can have better understanding of changes in biodiversity over time for things like the Convention on Biological Diversity or other sort of global assessments of how, um, how biodiversity is changing over time. So that's really um, where I'm coming from with this. I'm not a, a biologging specialist per se, but I just wanna get the data shared and um, yeah, I think that probably about covers it for me. So, thanks. Okay, thanks, Abby. Sarah, would you mind saying a few words? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Sarah Davidson. I'm the curator at MoveBank. So, MoveBank is a research platform for animal tracking and other kinds of animal born sensor data. Um, it's hosted uh, by the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. So funding is coming primarily from the um, Max Planck Society in Germany, as were established around 2011. Um, so I guess some of what we're working on, what I work on, um, is integrating new uh, data types and attributes. So we have a public vo uh, published vocabulary, um, and then we're running data feeds for about 15 manufacturers where people can have data input and. Um, then they become harmonized with that model and vocabulary, our data model vocabulary, or people can bring in their own data and um, kind of map it into the model themselves. Um, so I spend a lot of time with uh, data 
curation and we also offer data publication through a repository. We're working right now on getting that um, certified as a core trust seal repository. Um, and then we maintain a public API. And so along with the vocabulary that allows other groups and, and within our group uh, at Max Planck to develop apps and other programs um, that can work with that. Um, for Darwin Core and GBIF, I mean, one kind of, I'm, I'm really interested in providing sample data sets and feedback on, on standards or, and related tools. Um, it's, it ends up being like not, I mean, we haven't made as much, much progress on it as we'd like. It's like, I'd like to have a full-time person just working on it. it, kind of seems what we need. I mean, one big question that I think has already been brought up that is, you know, if, I mean, it, yeah, it, when you show that map, Peggy, it's, it's really like to see how little machine observations are reflected in these kind of biodiversity aggregators, like, well, we're missing like some really big pieces here. Um, and so one thing I'd like to hear from people is what, if, you, what are you expecting to get from like GBIF? Are you expecting to, do you want to discover, are you, are you wanting to discover that the data exists? Are you wanting some kind of aggregate or summary of the observations pulled from, from that data set? Do you want the other, you know, how do you want other environmental sensors somehow reflected in there? Um, yeah, so that's, that, that's my big question is like, what, what would be the success story? Yeah, and I think um, I, I I think a bit later on we'll get to um, we'll get to some discussions about that because yeah, um, yeah it's it, it, you know it's a good question that this group keeps on coming back around to um, what 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 for and uh, you know it looks important <laughs> but what exactly for cool thank you Sarah uh, Holger oh, thank you Peggy. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Olga Detki. I am located in Sweden at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, and I'm working there as the managing director for Swedish LifeWatch. Uh, in this context, uh, I'm working also as the uh, coordinator for the wireless remote animal monitoring e infrastructure, which is part of Swedish LifeWatch. And this is the Swedish system for um, biologging data. Um, we have a we have a system in place since 2003 approximately, uh, which contains uh, to somewhat more than two uh, 265 million uh, measurements from uh, more than 5,000 individual animals. Everything from from tracking GPS tracking to uh, heartbeat. Uh, physiological sensors. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we started to have uh, aggregation algorithms in place to get this part of this data into, into Swedish, into Swedish LifeWatch and from there to GBIF. Um, so this is why I'm interested in this group, why I, why I joined this group. Another point I'm very interested in is the, uh, the way how we get data from the actual sensors into the repository. Uh, this is a different, slightly different questions, a different, uh, different standards needed here, but we are also working, working on this uh, in other contexts. Thanks. Sure, thanks, Holger. Uh, I haven't made a specific list of my co-hosts. Have I missed anybody besides myself? No, I don't think so. Um, and um, I thought I'd, uh, you know, I'll just go over myself as well. Um, so I'm uh, from the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, I started off there um, having built a Zoatrack a platform for visualising, um, analysing and sharing tracking data. Um, for years, uh, my problem has been how to get the tracking data from Zoatrack into the Atlas and I still haven't really solved that problem. Um, now I find myself acting in the data manager role at the, um, at the Atlas this year. Um, I've also been working with uh, iNaturalist, setting up an Australian node of iNaturalist and um, I've been maintaining our R package 
Um, but this year has been data management and I'm getting used to the world of IPTs and Darwin Core and um, all things a little bit more relevant. Um, I'm comfortable here um, at this at the coalface of data loading um, and I'm starting to understand these challenges a lot with a lot more clarity, I guess. Um, for me, uh, one of the really exciting things that we're working on this year um, is, uh, is co-developing um, our infrastructure with GBIF. Um, so we're uh, working on like our de development teams are starting to work together um, and we'll be working a lot more closely in, in future years. So that's with um, both the ingestion pipelines and uh, the registry. Um, there's exciting technology, lots of opportunity for um, not only just scaling up volumes, but um, you know, for us, and but also um, there's some really fantastic analytics capabilities. Uh, Zootrack is sitting a, a little bit unloved with me and my new role at the moment, um, but and we're still trying to work out what to do with it. Um, MoveBank offers most of the functionality um, that it, it that it handles, but um, there still seems to be a place um, in Australia for um, for what it does in the biodiversity data landscape. Um, it probably needs a new look and it definitely needs new, better interoperability. Um, Australia is, um, is a huge producer of biologging data. Um, so for this year, um, I haven't really spent much time um, on, on uh, setting up meetings or working with this group or the biologging society group, but um, uh, John and I have been involved with um, a paper on um, that's I can't talk much about because it's about to be submitted. Um, that's working on a, a, a framework for biologging data and that's uh, for standardising biologging data and that's pretty exciting because it talks about um, all of the different phases uh, uh, of the life cycle from raw sensor data through to um, uh, uh, deployment data and quality control data. So it's 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 a really interesting piece of work. Um, and I think uh, you know I think the take home message that I'm uh, getting from the bit of experience I've had with that is the importance of vocabularies um, to standardisation. So um, that's that for me. Uh, would anyone else like to uh, put their hand up and introduce themselves to the group? Give us any background. Nope. Okay. Tim has got his hand up. Ah, Tim. Oh, yes. Let him. Let Tim in then. <laughs> Hi, uh, um, I know Hi, I'm Tim. You. Um, so I'm very interested in this group, particularly for, um, for well, I'm, I'm interested in everything that you do, but particularly what uh, Sarah um, described is understanding how we should shape data coming from MoveBank and connect it with the GBIF infrastructure for discovery. Uh, what level of uh, aggregation we should do on that data? I don't know the answer, but I'm interested in that problem and working particularly with Peter and others on the mechanics of how we can transform data from the standards that you're dealing with that are natural for how you collect data into a format that um, can improve discoverability and integration in GBIF. Yes, thanks Tim. And Ben. I, I'm Ben Norton and I'm really interested in taking camera trap data from the big repositories. I work a lot with, I, I do stuff with MoveBank too, um, but stuff with eMAML and wildlife insights and machine learning and image recognition and how those can be applied and integrated into GBIF and especially big camera trap data sets and how we can take that and adapt it to Darwin Core standard. And um, we need to develop our own standard first. It's <laughs> sort of like step one, step two, but this is skipping on down the line a little bit. But eventually we'd like to do a lot of camera trap data into GBIF and how we can integrate that to Darwin Core infrastructure is really important. So. Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, 
is there, uh, uh, Sarah, does MoveBank deal with camera trap data? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we will take a quick look at No. <laughs> Hey, how's it going, sir? So, <laughs> mutual <laughs> colleagues that I think that are very closely related to the same type of thing. Yeah, we are we are very adjacent to uh, camera trapping, but we uh, uh, there's a kind of especially like wildlife insights. I mean, stuff Ben is working on is kind of building their more focused uh, camera trapping stuff, and so I'm very yeah. happy to. <laughs> I'll let them go. <laughs> I, I just tell Sarah what's wrong with her website. That's really all. That's really okay. wrong and then we, yes. No, just, sure. And we like to talk about that. I just wanted to point out Steve's in the chat. He wants us to know that Audubon Core is uh, potentially very ready to look at uh, camera trap data, and he'd love to know what's missing if it's not. So uh, Steve would be an excellent person to, to possibly help us through that. Interesting. Oh, Anton's got a sand up. <laughs> Anton, this is a camera trap data model here on the wall. You can see it's nice, uh, very clear. Good. Anton, hi. Hi, I'm uh, Anton Valdepito. I manage the SCAR Antarctic Biodiversity Portal, and we act as a node for OBIS and GBIF. Uh, we have a lot of researchers working with different kinds of. Uh, uh, machine observations. So we've worked in the last couple of years on a big data set um, of Antarctic tracking data. Um, but we have interest in, in, in other things as well. And actually, um, with the mention of Audubon Core, I realized we have another one where there's a big interest, which is actually um, 3D imagery from um, automated underwater videos, where we have a big interest in our community on, on learning on how we can submit that into things like uh, OBIS and, and GBIF. Wow, 3D imagery. <laughs> that sounds like some sort of data nightmare. <laughs> but fun. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anton. Uh, Deb? Oh, you just made me think. Up? Sure, that made me think of two things. One, there's a huge 3D project going on to, to build 3D models for like all the mammals of the world at, um, at IDIG Bio. So from all, well, the OVER is its own museum network. Doing that, all the data will come to IDIG Bio. Um, but I, it made me wonder, thinking big about ways in which to move forward, not in just the standards, but the use or the awareness and the, and the ability to integrate this integration conversation. And it, it, I wondered about the possibility for things like the NASA Space Apps Challenge model, where you actually would put data out there and say, how would you integrate this? And, and get give people an opportunity to, to try to do different things with it. Because when you start talking about the underwater pictures, I started thinking also about the satellite imagery and sort of like epibiota, it's the way you want to sort of, we're taking the world apart, right? The entomologists go and collect the insects or take the pictures of those and somebody else goes and does them. And then there are all these pieces, sounds and whatever. And now we would like to sort of integrate them. Yes, put them back together so we can see the 3D image of the frog and the water that the frog was in and et cetera, right? And the, all the data sort mm -hmm. of together. Uh, so anyway, I just was thinking of other ways in which we could ask the integration question and test the possibilities by uh, joining something like the NASA Space Apps Challenge. And if that's interesting mm -hmm. to people, it's a, somebody could pursue that. Interesting, thank you. Thanks, Deb. Is there anybody else who'd like to put their hand up and introduce themselves? Peter? You've I can't your, put up my, my hand up because I'm <laughs> uh, hosting. So uh, I'm a data scientist working at Mesa Botanic Garden and it's a sort of a side project. I've been working on publishing our uh, camera trap data set that has been enriched on our crowdsourcing platform. And that's why I'm, uh, I have gotten more and more interested in machine observation from uh, the data side in the last few months. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Anyone else? I think we might have gone through. 
what I might do uh, at the moment, the next thing on our schedule is to go through our uh, our GitHub our GitHub repository and have a look at that. Um, I kind I I do get the feeling that we've got. Um, a lot of questions um, and uh, some discussions that would be really valuable to have here while we've got so many people and I kind of feel that the um, uh, feel like getting straight on to that but I'll just uh, bring up what I might do is just share screen and bring up the um, github repository there's links to it in the Google Doc um, briefly show the group what it's about and uh, how you can and, and how you can uh, get involved with it. Just give me a moment. I've put a link in the chat. Thanks. Share the screen again. So this is our. Um, it, this is not actually on the machine observations uh, charter page. It's uh, it's a separate GitHub repository in the Tadwig um, GitHub organisation. Uh, we set it up to. Um, um, it's a, it's a work in progress, very much a work in progress, and um, the idea being that we, uh, uh, as a group, would work on a couple of. Um, use cases of applying uh, applying Darwin Core to a couple of data sets. Um, we've got two uh, in play at the moment. Um, John has been working on uh, some acoustic, uh, quite a large data set of acoustic tracking um, blue sharks. And uh, we have a move bank data set here um, uh, that was combined. It's a, it's a, it's a quite a quite a large study with a couple of different uh, species and a few different types um, of data, including accelerometer data. Um, so we have some e exemplars there. Uh, I guess um, we're still finding our feet in terms of um, in terms of how to you know execute this as a group. Uh, not having been meeting all that much. Um, you can uh, add issues to the um, to the list and we generally um, get a bit of discussion from from those. We have a pull, pull request or two for some other data sets uh, to look at at the moment and we have a wiki that makes some recommendations um, make some recommendations about how to use um, how to use each of the fields uh, and for data and metadata metadata guidelines uh, I think the basic um, if I could try to describe just to describe the basic model we're trying to apply is that um, generally with a sensor deployment um, generally with a sensor deployment we would model that as a um, an animal is almost always captured um, and observed by a human. So we have a human observation with which we associate um, all of the biotic measurements and um, other sort of measurement or fact um, information that comes. Uh, we we keep that information associated with the human observation, um, and we have a, a event core helps us to. Um, link events and occurrences. Uh, I, I can't describe this. I haven't prepared. <laughs> I haven't prepared a description of this, um, and I can't do it off the bat. I'm really sorry. <laughs> We've worked out a model that basically works, where we have a human observation and a series of machine observations tied together by events, um, and um, the machine uh, that the, the the tie is the organism ID. We group them together by organism ID. Uh, trying to summarise this is actually quite tricky, um, but 
the idea is we wanted to um, try to work out these common, uh, common approaches we can take with these kinds of studies so that people know how to, um, how to model in Darwin Core and how to um, you know, get data across to these um, biodiversity repositories. Uh, does anyone have any questions about that? Peter? Um, not a question about the repository, uh, but I'm getting a lot of questions and activities and that really tries to capture um, the camera trap data it doesn't try to stick to Darwin Core. But what would be good, even if we don't agree on for even these different types of data like camera trap data, I think there will be different community standards around. Um, but it would be good that within this group, we can kind of agree on how to represent that as Darwin Core so it could be uh, harvested. Um, so even if there's different standards there, uh, that it could be mapped as a group to Darwin Core in the same way. And to answer Sharon Grant's question, there is an older standard which is called the Camera Trap Metadata Standard, which is described in a paper. But what we've discovered is that that standard and how it is described is one lacking to really capture all camera trap information and also not documented, maintained or uh, versioned uh, for the moment. But maybe Ben can add to that. Ben, you're raising your hand. <laughs> so a couple of things. So um, regarding Darwin Core, the way we're approaching it now is that we think that the star schema and event-based uh, structure works. There's a great paper, GBIF, about camera trap data, but there, there's an extension necessary to capture all of basically a lot of the camera trap data. It doesn't quite fit, but the basic structure is there. But we think an extension can solve that issue. Um, and so we can start ingesting data from things like, you know, eMAML and wildlife insights into uh, GBIF using the Darwin Core, as long as we create that extension. The camera trap metadata paper, uh, the one we're working on was that was the basis, that was the starting place as we, as we see it, um, that it was a good first attempt. It's got some minimal metadata in there, but it's got our, the one we've developed and working on now is, is evolved quite a bit. And so, and, and I need to, and there's a lot of metadata models out there and I need to talk to Peter and, and, and talk about this kind of stuff about what, how their approaches are. It's a little bit different as far as I can tell um, of how we discrete. We, I'm pretty, I, I'm kind of a stickler about uh, definitions and tables and column names and things. And I, I separate locations from deployments, for example, because deployments are the activity. Location is the spatial reference of where that activity took place, which is pretty technical. I think it's really important. Some people sort of disagree with me on that one, but um, we're sort of trying to get it down to the bare bones and work these things out, but we have a way to go. Um, right now, the Wildlife Insights Glossary, if you go to that one, that's it, the one we're developing is an offshoot. The way I see it is that uh, a, any kind of software application has to make compromises um, just by, because there's a front end, there's UI, there's user, there's a target audience, things like that. And that those compromises can affect the internal data model of the application. And what's more effective is you have a data standard that's aside from the application because it's agnostic. It doesn't have to compromise based on, you know, a UI interface or some contract or Ajax model or whatever that we're going to talk about. Um, and so sort of agnostic from any system without compromise, then other systems can be built from that data standard itself. And so, but this is how we're, we're sort of separating the two from wildlife insights to a, a side, you know, data metal. So as a, as a newbie to the group, and I don't know, if you're going to cover this kind of stuff later and if you are then just tell me to shush I'm used to that um where do we start then where does where does the person who doesn't who has this data and now needs to get it out there where do we start and is there a plan Ben to spin up a task group if there isn't already one to work on this extension that you're talking about I don't know. This is my, <laughs> so I, I, I've published collections data. I, I'm the collections data curator at the museum and I've done collections data Darwin Core for years until camera trap was just sort of a recent thing. I've done uh, collections data for seven, eight years in the Darwin Core, but um, this is, this camera trap thing is new. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm <laughs> I just, just, I talked to a colleague at the museum at Roland Case yesterday about this, how we're going to, he, he's the one that works on MoveBank as well on camera traps. I wrote a couple of books on them and, and uh, I'm not really sure. And so that's a very good question. And I kind of have the same one. Um, or where to start and how to put this sort of community and collaboration together. So that's, that's very... May I ask what the gaps are that the extension would um, cover? So there are things like um, on the event base, you have one value for uh, sample size unit and value, I think. And so in camera trap, um, you know, you have detection distance, you have things like camera height, you have 
burst length. So when you when an animal walks by, you take you don't take one picture, you take a bunch of them, and it's called a sequence or a burst or different people call it different things. And how long is that? eMammal, for example, the biggest repository has one unit across the board. All sequences I think are 30, 60 seconds long, and that's how they define it. But that's a pretty important thing because machine learning and these AI models do it image by image. They don't care about sequences. And so, mm -hmm. and if you, are, do the results change and from 45 seconds, 60 seconds, these types of things. But that's just as important as detection distance. So there's not one necessary sort of unit of measurement that's representative of an actual deployment, which is the equivalent to an event. And so there are little details like that that we need to work in. Um, but the overall model, the SCAR schema, you have an activity, the event is deployment, captures photos, those are occurrences of animals, which are backed up by physical or like digital photos. And so it works mm -hmm. kind of the same way as the collections do, but it's a little bit, there's some, you know, um, details about camera chips that are really important to capture, but they aren't exactly you know, reflected in the model as it is right now. Yeah, similar to biologging. So, uh, you know, the details, um, those details are important to capture, but then, um, it, 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 you know, getting the data crossover into into GBIF, um, which primarily looks at occurrence data, um, means how complete do you want that data set and should it be published a different way elsewhere? Um, I think Darwin Core can do it. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a big believer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've been doing it for years. I, I really am. I, I really, I think it's there. I mean, data loss is my number one thing that I cannot happen. Uh, data, you know, and we do, there are things we don't, in our collections, our curators are very serious about, we collect, like I just had a discussion with John about previous accession numbers. Our curators are big about them. They argue they are different. They do not belong with other catalog numbers. Um, so they are separate and they don't make it over to Darwin Core because there isn't a field explicitly for those. So we have our own collections website, things like that, just to incorporate that kind of thing. But I like to minimize that because all we need, I don't think any of us would rather see another data repository <laughs> to handle or another place to publish or another thing out there. So bringing these things together, I think is more effective than creating more of them if possible. Okay, thanks Ben. Peter. Yeah, I'm just curious also, is, is there any, yeah, from a data publisher uh, or a data owner, if you publish your data in what you've been told that it is good to publish your data, I'm publishing my data in MoveBank. I mean, for there, it should stop for me as a data publisher. I should not do any more work to map that to, to Darwin Core. Um, I'm, I'm wondering from the MoveBank and also from the GBIF perspective, with the help of this group, um, if JBIF could, for example, harvest data that is expressed in like the move bank format or in the camera trap standard that has been used by the community. And then with this group helping JBIF to actually translate this so it fits as JBIF occurrence and event data with measurements and facts. And then maybe Sarah or Tim can come on from that. I mean, one thing, since we've got a group of people here, I mean, one question I just come back to is like, what, what is the use case? Because, you know, that example we have in the GitHub took a long time. There's a bunch of stuff that would be completely different if I grabbed another test, another example study. And that's only, and it's only what, like three out of 40 deployments in that study or something. So there's, um, it gets quite big and the model is different in Darwin Core than it is in MoveBanks. But there is a simpler thing, which is like grabbing something about the number of animals, the first and last location, or all the lat longs and don't worry about other sensor data. Or like, it, so some decision could be made about what would be the most useful core piece to get over to GBIF. Um, or if somebody wants to like build a harvesting tool and, and I would be very happy to give feedback on it. I love that too. Um, but yeah, so I mean, use cases, like what would someone like to be able to do? Would they like to find it in GBIF and then go use, you know, MoveBank's API or Wildlife Insights API to get this stuff in more kind of format? Um, are the, is that the type of array they wanna see or is there some value to have? you know, what pieces of it are, have an added value to be in Darwin Core. Um, so like, yeah, for me, like specific use cases would, would be a huge in um, making those decisions because I feel still like I'm kind of, would be making it up. Other than like, I would have a bias towards kind of keeping it simple because it's more likely that I could implement it somehow eventually. <laughs> so that's my answer to your question. 
your, your question, Peter. I think this is the group to work through those problems. I feel that you've been priming me on private chat for this question already. Um, I would like to work with you um, in, in tackling some of those things and with, with Sarah and with others. I think we do need to go through use cases, Sarah. Um, I, I, until we actually start playing around with examples um, to see what's possible, um, I, I think we're all just going to be guessing. So it's going to take a bit of time from people like myself and Peter and perhaps Ben and others who, who like to wrangle data. And let's, uh, let's see how far we can push um, the Darwin core structures with an extension. I like the idea that uh, we definitely need lossless data um, packaging, but it could be the case that it's lossless as it goes into MoveBank, but as it's transferred over to GBIF, perhaps it's downscaled or uh, subsampled or you know uh, simplified as long as there's the correct links back to MoveBank where people can find the richer data. Um, that could be one, one approach. Camera trap data, uh, I presume, is much smaller than some of the tracking data sets. And I could imagine that we could get lossless uh, transfer formats for camera trap data, but perhaps I'm being naive. So I, I think we should work through examples. I think there's probably the right kind of people in this group. Um, we just need to, we need to help uh, Peggy um, sort of progress that. I, the feeling I got from the last meeting was that um, because um, it was that when we started, we were concerned about volumes as well. And, um, you know, whether like the size of MoveBank was X billion, X billion detections and the size of GBIF was um, comparable at the time. And now, you know, with our... Uh, sc scalable infrastructure. I just that's just not a concern anymore, and I think that came through pretty loud and clear at our last meeting. The other thing um, that uh, you know, that this problem of lossless data, um, uh, you know, is an interesting one. Really, with tracking studies, there's a lot of environmental data sets that are coming along with um, other biotic measurements, heart rate, accelerometry, and, and that kind of thing. And um, my feeling is within, um, you know, the AL, from the ALA's perspective and, and um, probably with GBIF as well, that really the occurrence species date time, uh, species location time um, data is, 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 is a good starting point. Um, and that there perhaps doesn't need to be aggregation of that so much, but the other measurements um, are perhaps those that don't need to come across. And the classic example that I come back to all the time is, um, is Holger's 18 terabytes of heart rate data from the uh, three moose. Um, we probably don't really want that over in GBIF. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, and that, um, that covers us off too, because one of the things um, uh, with the ALA embarking on um, study of the environment reporting and looking at this bio, biodiversity indicator reporting and wanting to participate in that um, a, lot, a lot more and have a rich data sets is that movement data is not making it. Without movement data in our data sets, we, uh, um, you, you know, we, we could be better. Um, so I think... I, I think that occurrence level data is a good granularity um, to start with, personally. Sharon Grant has raised her hands. Sharon. Gee, I'm gonna steal it. You, you, you were talking about um, use cases, Sarah and Tim, and um, so we're just getting into this. I'm at the Film Museum in Chicago for folks I they don't recognize. Um, and I noticed that a couple of my colleagues from there who actually work up in the center that has this data are here. So I wondered maybe Michelle could talk about and Zach the data that we have and maybe as use cases go, this might kind of tell you where we, we'd like to go. Sure, um, thanks Sharon. I, um, so I work on the rapid inventory team at the Field Museum and we basically about once a year do um, like month long expeditions in, in South America. And so we do have a, 
a lot of camera trap data that I think would be very valuable. And we're, yeah, we just like don't know how to start. We want to share it. And, you know, we had been looking at Wildlife Insights and the Field Museum also, um, you know, shares everything with GBIF. And we, it's just been really hard to figure out this transition to how do we get this data out there? And yes, the, the main information would be, you know, like occurrence. Um, but we also, like was mentioned earlier, don't want to lose all that extra data that is associated with camera traps. Um, secondly, we also have acoustic um, data. So we put out automated recorders and um, to try and identify species by call. And that's, I'm finding that's really tricky. So I do it and I focus on frogs and I can go through all the data and, you know, we have a How do you publish the whole data set? You have all these other recordings where you don't have identified species, but there are things calling. Or you have um, data that you're publishing, like a recording where you identified two frog calls, per se, but there's a bunch of other background species. And I'm just, how do we handle all this and how do we publish it without losing information? Like, um, yeah, that's where we are, basically. Those are the two main things. And also, like what was said, there's, you know, uh, Are we this? losing Michelle? Or yeah, she cut out for a moment there. Michelle, could you go again? Just that last bit. The, oh, am I stable now? Okay. Sorry. The, things like temperature and humidity data that are really, I don't know about birds, but for frog calls, it's really important to have that information with the call because it affects the energetics and the calls of the species. And that's taken in, you know, conjunction with the recordings, but it's different. You know, you might want to use the whole data from the temperature from the whole day, you know, this, you know, at each hour, but the call data is like, you know, one minute at 2 p.m. or something. So how do you like link all this up in the, in the GBF and the, you know, something like Darwin Core? It's hard to say. So I don't know, Sharon, does that, I think that sums up some of the problems we're having, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So that, that's, that's our use case, Tim, Sarah, and there are other bits and pieces. We have drone data, we have all kinds of flight stuff from those rapid inventories that needs to go out. So with, um, so with your use case, um, uh, uh, Sharon and Michelle, can I ask what would be useful to you? Like, how do you think, uh, you know, what kind of information can, um, what kind of support can a group like this offer you that would be helpful? So I guess I see at least you guys as, you, you, you're obviously using whichever bits of the standard you need to be using and some, some guidance on the GitHub site, you know, some, maybe tutorials or something, where, where do you even start? And then, you know, if, if there is, if there is part, if there are parts of Darwin Core that aren't fully fleshed out, you know, spinning up that group to get that bit built, you know, I think, I think, cause looking through the, the rest of the web world for stuff, I found the thing I sent to Peter before I found the machine observation stuff and I'm trying to dig into it and it's, yeah, it's a bit of a black hole. And so a bit yeah. more clarity would be nice. Yeah, sure. I do wonder whether um, one, of, uh, one of the things this group could do is um, uh, when we attract use cases is to actually um, uh, have, ses have meeting sessions like this where we, um, where we just talk it through, really. Um, um, the, the problem that we have and uh, perhaps, yeah, perhaps try to get the group working that way more with people speaking to each other than um, uh, intermittently about particular data sets. Um, and, and maybe GBIF can help with that. I, I know they do a lot of training around Darwin Core, but as this is kind of coming online, maybe that's something that could be built in or thought about on the GBIF end as to how do you, you know, maybe set up some like the old Darwin Court Hour about this. Mm. We got yeah. Ben and Peter and Tim. Ben's been waiting for a bit. Oh, okay, sorry. Peter, you want to go ahead? I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think, yeah, so 
that's one of the things I've been looking for too, like a kind of a guidance, like I'm new to machine observations data and I have this data that is coming here and I have to publish it now, like uh, basically Michelle's use case. And then what do I use? And I think one of the tasks that of this group could be is like have this reference list of one repositories where you can put that kind of data. And very often that's within associated import format or an exchange format. And I think an additional step, which is currently not there, uh, not that I know, is like how to publish this in Darwin course efficiently. Um, so yeah, this kind of reference list would be very useful for me too. Uh, but mm. yeah, it takes a collaborative approach to actually build it. And also if you just have a list of repositories and formats, you can look around a bit, but yeah, I mean, context is also important, uh, I think. For example, yeah, if you're US based and you are interested in putting this data on wildlife insights or you're more uh, a European camera trap project and you're interested in putting this in Euromammal, it's a very dense world and this is only then camera trap data. So yeah, it's, it's always going to be a bit of an opinionated list, but it might be useful already for people who are new to this. Um, but as a volunteer group, it of course takes uh, yeah, an effort to, to build such lists. Ben. Sure. So I think for camera trap data, I really think that the IPT can be used with it with one extension covering some fields, the IPT can cover it. I really do. I think, um, and I mean, sure, we might have differences in our data models and things like how we handle deployments or locations and, you know, activities and events and things, where we call them. But I don't see any reason why the IPT can't do it, that you can map a, a camera trap data into, because at the end of the day, it's, a, it's different than the tracking data. Tracking data is huge. At the end of the day, it's almost the same as, I view it as the same as collections. You have a specimen in a container and that specimen is backed up in the species occurrence, right? It's the exact same thing with photo camera traps. You have a photo instead of a physical specimen that backs up that species occurrence. It's the exact same thing. And so at the end of the day, it, you can keep it that simple and it really can just map it right in with one extension to cover it and you're all set. And I think also with software, if you go into a system like EMAM or a wildlife insights, whatever, you can't expect people then to publish to GBIF. It's just not going to happen. I think if they go into one with you, you got to help them go the other, you know, make the second hop. And I don't think it's, I, and I think that's perfectly possible. I mean, I don't think there's a problem at all. I think iNaturalist got dumped all over. I know you and iNaturalist, you skip over there, Encyclopedia of Life and these kinds of things, but publishing in multiple locations is too much for people. And then nobody has time on their hands, right? And so I think when you do have a big repository, at least decrease the number that we use and also making sure that you can jump from one to the other that system automatically does it is good. And I think the infrastructure to make that happen is already there as well. It's just about putting it and making sure those things get mapped. But that's all. Tim, you had your hand raised before. I, th I think I was gonna say very similar to what you were saying, Peter. I, I like the approach that, that Peter's taking where he's creating frictionless data packages for the data sets that he's preparing. I wonder if we should be looking at those schemas and seeing if uh, they're in a format that Michelle could put her data in, um, see if that's like a, a natural format for how she could shape her data. And then the second step is how we transform those into a format that would be compatible with GBIF or ALA. Um, and actually take those as two separate problems, how to shape your data and archive it in a lossless way, and then how to get it into GBIF as a second step. Um, I would like to test uh, Ben's theory that camera trap data can all be done in a, an IPT. Um, I'll work with you on that. Um, and if you, you think you're nearly there, it's, it sounds like you've got a fairly <laughs> clear idea in your head. Let's get it out of your head and into the IPT sandbox. <laughs> sounds good. Peter and I can certainly help with that. Um, and we'll be happy to, to bring others on in that process to try and share the knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. That sounds good. Yeah, if, that, if, if you want to spin something up, I have Michelle and Zach who have data and I have an IPT and stuff so i'd be all about helping out with that one if if something gets going happy happy well i'm wondering if we just approach this like we did with the biologging um where we have some examples and we have the wiki and so 
we have a couple of people, it seemed like, who are ready and willing and want to jump in and do the mapping. So we put it up on the wiki so that it's not, uh, so it's transparent to other people how they might do this in the future if they want to. And then we just go through GitHub issues and kind of do the same thing we did with the biologging data. Can you yeah, talk about that again. process a little bit? Because I'm not familiar with the whole, with the biologging time due to this as well. So sure. can you elaborate a little bit? Yes, so or I, I can I can try. Let me. Um, so uh, Peggy was showing our GitHub space um, uh, during part of. And I, I think I can share my screen, can't I? So maybe I will try to do you that. You should be time. able to, Abby. Yeah. Um, give me a sec to figure that out because it's always exciting to try to do this. Um, yes, sure. Okay. Um, okay, can you guys see? Is it and is it big enough? The yes, I think I think that's good. That's good for me. Okay, um, so this is our our GitHub space for our bio for biologging data. What I'm thinking is we would make a similar one for camera trap data, and so what you see here is you know here's um, the space we're working in. We have a wiki where we documented the guidelines for the data, which is, you know, we might want to run through this and think about how we would apply basis of record, how, you know, what the required fields would be and document all that. And it might be the same or it might be different than it is here for biologging data. You know, what the metadata guidelines are that we would need, what's required. Um, so the people who who are trying to do this also can can uh, run through this. But then what we also have are some use cases. So and I don't think we actually showed these, but you know here's an abstract of uh, data that uh, John uh, Pai is working on, and you know talks about why this use case, what we're doing with it. It shows the schema that we were thinking of working with that um, I don't think we're all in agreement on, but something to think about. Um, so it's kind of just documenting, um, okay, here's what we're going to do with camera trap data. Here's where we see it aligning with the standard or not aligning and um, having some use cases up that people can react to. And then the final part of it is we have, uh, we try to put things in GitHub issues. So when a data set goes up um, that we're kind of looking at and reviewing, we will put up uh, questions about it in the in the GitHub issues so that we can kind of talk about the the questions that we have about how well it's lining up with our own core or not. Does that and, help a bit? Ben? Sorry, John, go ahead. Um, I wanted to thank Anton for putting uh, Maxime Sweetlove in touch with us too for, for providing the first of those uh, data sets provided from outside the group. So I was really hoping that would catch on and uh, I really like the data set that was supplied. So thanks for putting us in touch, Anton. That's excellent. So it's sounding to me like um, we probably need to um, find uh, t to choose a particular camera trap data set and um, meet about it um, over the coming months and uh, set up a use case for it on the site um, and start to document that with um, perhaps with um, Ben and Sharon and Michelle. Does that sound like a plan? It does. Okay. Can I ask um, Tim or Peter, could you give us a little bit of background on frictionless data schemas? I don't understand what they are. <laughs> You're pointing to Sarah on my screen. <laughs> okay, I can try. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so frictionless data schemas and they were originally, they're, they're a standard for um, publishing CSV files on the web. And Darwin Core is, as uh, Darwin Core archives are also a format for publishing CSV files on the web. And Tim was actually involved in a working group at W3C to um, discuss and have a, a standard for these. But frictionless data is one that has been adopted uh, quite a lot um, in the like in many open data formats, like for example, you could publish financial data uh, as frictionless data. And it's basically very similar to anyone who's uh, familiar with Darwin Core archives. You have a number of CSV files 
which have column headers, and those are described in a JSON file, where you basically say, these are the columns I have in my CSV files. These are how the CSV files are related to each other. And um, there's, uh, in, in addition to Darwin Core Archives, it actually says for each column very specifically what data type it ex uh, expects, and also maybe some constraints. So you could say my latitude and longitude have to be, or my latitude should be between this and this number. So you can actually add some kind of a specification to your data format too. And uh, just as with Darwin Core Archives, the uh, data set metadata can also be described, but rather than having a meta XML file in the EML XML file, this is combined into one JSON file. And there are very many tools already existing in many languages to be able to harvest uh, and read this type of uh, packages, and they're called data packages. And there's two things. There's the data packages, which you can see as the Darwin Core Archives, and then there's stable schemas, which is a way to express how one single CSV file or a relation of CSV files in that package should look like. Uh, and Andre Heugebaert is going to give a presentation on how to map Darwin Core Archives to frictionless data packages tomorrow in the uh, BioCase IPT session. Oh, he really? has developed a software to actually transform a Darwin Core Archive to a frictionless data package. What Tim and I are thinking about is if we can break free, I mean, because data packages don't have the star schema necessarily of Darwin Core Archives, if Breaking free from the star schema, this would allow to better model certain types of data. Why don't we publish data as frictionless data packages? And then GBIF can harvest these on, in addition to BioCase and Darwin Core Archives. So that is why I was mentioning in the chat too that we can think a little bit further than the star schema of Darwin Core Archives if that better fits the model of the data that we have. Tim, anything you want to add to this? No, that was perfect. I put links to uh, Andre's blog in the chat while you were talking um, and mentioned the presentation. Um, uh, P Peter and I both believe that if we can get to the stage that a, a researcher can publish their data set in a frictionless data package using uh, schemas which are shared with other people in a, a natural format, the second step can be working out uh, how to transform that into a format that GBIF and ALA and other infrastructures support today. But it means that the researcher is not um, forcing their data into a format that's not natural. Um, just as an aside really for you, Peggy, I suspect this is where our work next year for ecological data sets is gonna go for GBIF and ALA. It's the same problem. It's the star schema restriction. Mm. They're looking to, to model sampling effort. Mm. And I would like to add to this to Sarah Davidson. One of the things I would like, for example, in publishing move bank data on a repository is rather than having that readme file, is to have a readme file as a JSON format so that it's actually machine readable too. So a machine can understand, oh, this CSV file is GPS tracking data and this CSV file is acceleration data. So uh, that it can be described in a way that is also machine readable. So I think that is something I want to do with the data sets I've been publishing from MoveBank to Zenodo to actually just translate that uh, readme.txt file into a machine readable one and yeah. then it can be harvested. Yeah. If you are preparing some of those or you want to have plan a time to meet, I'm like completely on board. I made up that readme thing. Yeah. Like 10 years ago. <laughs> I, I think everything, everything <laughs> is already there. You have the CSV exactly. files. No, I mean, after yeah. we got the vocabulary published, I've been absolutely, and I, I might keep that very human readable version, but I'd like to automate the whole thing. And um, I'm kind of trying to figure out who I can get to help me with doing that. And I, I'd be very happy to have you. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've got some people at the library here too, um, kind of like moving towards that with as well. But definitely let's talk about it because I am very, uh, I totally agree with that idea. So that readme file in MoveBank, that's the readme that comes with the publication, with a the MoveBank publication. publication. Yeah. And I would, oh, yeah. I mean, once we got it that far, it could be possible to have something similar that's built 
with a download from MoveBank. Definitely the repository would be the, um, the place to kind of figure it out and apply it first, but um, hmm. yeah, we could do other things with it, I think. Is that, um, is that another meeting that we're organizing? I can't commit to anything at this meeting, but <laughs> if somebody sends me emails, um, yeah, I, I think that like, yeah, for the coming year, that could definitely be a, a goal. Pete, Peter and I have arranged to meet in 11 hours to start looking at his use cases. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, as I said at the very beginning, it's camera trap data, move bank GPS data, and acoustic telemetry data for fish. For all of these, we're publishing this in a format, ideally a community format that is out there. Uh, but then I'm, my big mm -hmm. wish is that this is also harvested by Jill. And I don't want to, I mean, I'm one of the more crazy people who likes data transformation, but what I would like is that with the work that I'm doing, if anybody's publishing their data set on MoveBank and it is deposited on the MoveBank repository, that that data can be just harvested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. um, for the acoustic, um, I've been working with, so this is actually something we were hoping to present at the biologging meeting, um, the biologging symposium that was supposed to be happening like right now. So, but then COVID, so, uh, but MODIS, which does uh, their a radio telemetry array system, we, we've been working for a couple of years now and fig they, they came up with a way to kind of take their telemetry data sets and push them to move bank or allow, allow data owners to push them to move bank in a way that is more of a, a tracking data style of a data set, so not not keeping kind of the metadata um, management at MODIS on their system, and also kind of like all the pings of things, and and not not sending like the lossless data over to MoveBank, but a version that is kind of that looks like a tracking data set, um, which is what you know some users would be looking for anyways, um, and we have it like all. Test. We haven't. We haven't. Put, it's not live yet, but we have a, a test system running, um, and so that. And I've been interested to see, like, once that's going, I want to see, like, well, with acoustic data, you know, we kind of have at least something to start with if we wanted to try something there as well. So, um, if any folks are interested in that, uh, I would. I would want to pull in the, the folks from Modus I've been working with, um, but that's definitely a discussion that could happen as well. And that also might be similar to how, you know, how that might want to go to, to GBIF as well. Sure. Yeah, it would be similar. So MODIS being a, um, terrestrial acoustic telemetry <laughs> with radio towers, yeah, and sensors on. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So I think that data model is... is um, Very similar to acoustic, yeah. Yeah, so I would, I would be really interested in digging into that. Yeah, I'm down that, to that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would be a good conversation. Raised hands from Ben, Sharon, and I see that John mentioned that Richard had a question in the notes. I think Richard's one is maybe the oldest one, so maybe we can take that one first. Nice. Rich, did you want to verbalize that for us? Or? Yeah, well, so, I mean, you can look at the end of the notes. I don't want to go into the whole detail of it, but the nature of the question is trying to get at what's a human observation, what's a machine observation. I mean, every observation goes through a whole workflow and different agents play a role in that workflow along the line, some of them human, some of them non-human. And, and, and I guess I was just try, initially trying to get my head around where you draw the line between an observation that's, that's a human observation versus a machine observation, which has practical issues and philosophical issues. But I guess what I'm trying to get my head around is, is it more about the assumptions of behind the decisions made to acquire that observation that separate a human from a machine observation? Or is it more about the technology used and, uh, and how it was used? Or is it more about the nature of the resulting data? So a lot of these machine observations result in, you know, huge, as Tim says, a different shape 
of data that you know we might want to analyze in different ways but some things are a little vague like you know what michelle was describing for the background noise of audio clips is exactly identical to what we have with human handheld video clips on a reef where you know we'll spend a two minute video clip of a fish and one fish occurrence records comes out of that video but in the background of that video are thousands of other organisms that are all potentially observation records so i guess in my mind, is it really the distinction more about the nature of the data and the volume and the granularity and the, and the you know, that sort of thing? Or is it more about how the, uh, the data were captured initially and the decisions behind how that data were captured and the assumptions behind those decisions? And I don't know, this may be a distraction, but it kind of gets at the core of what's, how do we distinguish these different kinds of observations? It's one of my favorite distractions, if it is a distraction. So um, I don't have a good answer to that question. I, I, think, um, I think what I'm doing is machine observation, but I have no like philosophical backing from which to think that. I think that, I guess, because the, the, the listening, listening stations go out and they don't know what they're going to hear. I guess uh, it's, it's non-deterministic, like you're not pointing in a camera at something and capturing it deliberately. It is something that is picked up. Uh, as part of a, an, a passive monitoring situation, but I, I don't think that's an authoritative view of the, of the subject. Well, I guess part of it is maybe a question directed at Peter is, is what about the existing Darwin core was inadequate for capturing the information as you wanted? Was it missing terms, metadata that you need to capture that, that are particular to machine type technology used for observation capture? Or was it more about you don't want to dump a billion records into GBIF because you have that many GPS data points on a telemetry track for a whale or something like that? Well, I, I've always wanted to dump a million records or a billion records in GBIF, so that was not really my, my issue here. For me, it was, I've always, uh, I mean, I've worked with Canadians with collection data, then we had human observation data from monitoring, long-term monitoring that we do at INBO. Uh, and it, it was just that one just, the structure of Darwin Core archives couldn't really fit all the data and there were terms missing. It was like shoehorning it into Darwin Core because I love Darwin Core so much. And um, yeah, this is where I was like, okay, but there's a lot of like, there's deployments of tags and there's deployments of receivers. Both are events. So you should just cram both of them in an event core and then have occurrences. And then there's measurements that are taken that are not related to the occurrences, but are related to the events. and. It, it was more the, yeah, this, like this type of data, where do we publish them as open data? So like the full granularity and like all the column fields, if you would express it that way, are available. Uh, and then how can we have like an, an extraction of that, like a reduced number of columns and maybe a reduced number of rows to have this as biodiversity data on JB and OBIS. So, and it is this type of, Sense, I mean, I see the sensor data, that is, you have a machine recording something. Uh, very often there's a human involved because you need to identify the fish if you add a tag to it, or you need to identify your camera trap images, you need to see what is on there. So there's some human observation involvement there too, but it's uh, more like you have this thing out there that is just spewing data and how do you want to publish this in a, uh, in a format that others can understand, basically. That's my Our, Yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing I was getting at. That's very helpful. I mean, we wrestled with a telemetry thing too, where we have a human event of deploying the receiver, a human event for deploying the transmitter, a human event for recovering each of the above, and then a whole bunch of machine events in between, which are each ping of the thing. And, and ultimately they're all events. Um, some of them involve human occurrences, some of them involve non-human occurrences, but but we did the same thing and sort of force fit them into Darwin Core. And, and I guess we just embraced the idea that it wasn't so much a force fit, it's just a natural fit. But you're right, there are terms and properties that, that would maybe be a Darwin Core extension to be able to capture that kind of metadata along with these things. Yeah, and, and also very often what I see is that researchers who don't think about Darwin Core, but just want to analyze camera trap data, in what format do they want the data? It's not in Darwin Core. Sometimes it's, or, or like GPS tracking data there, if it's like shoehorn in an event core, uh, like an event core and then an occurrence extension, and then they have measurement and facts that are repeated, 
at infinum for every occurrence record, they're not going to be very happy. They're like, no, my data was very nicely modeled there, and that's how I want to analyze it. It's more the, um, so that, that, that is what I would see, like the, the community standard for a certain type of machine observation data. But then, of course, as a publisher of this data and also trying to make this data more widely usable, how can you um, like derive uh, something more sensible or my, more widely applicable from it? Thanks. That, that exactly gets at my issue. Thanks. I Sarah. totally agree. That's, that's the kind of use case I'd like to see too, because I keep like no MoveBank user has ever asked me to, you know, can, can I get the data in Darwin core format? But what I, you know, so I, I don't, I think the use cases might be there, but those people aren't talking, they don't, they're not finding the data in GBIF, but right. So what I would imagine where some of these use cases could come in would be somebody who wants to take, you know, like the, the museum specimens and the, the human observations and the, you know, the camera trapping that we get into Jeep, like who wants to take from all those sources and do something with them? Because you do, you do see that where people who want to take like the eBird data and the tracking data and some stuff from GBIP and do something with it. And it's a huge pain for them to do. Um, so like if we could do something that would make that kind of thing much easier, um, but then what do they need? So yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and I don't know how, right, because it's kind of like until it's there, then you don't see the use case. Um, but if anybody knows folks, like the data user and people um, who could sort of describe what they would love to see, that would be really cool. A really nice API, a really nice, shiny, easy to use API where I can pick up everything all together and put into a map. Ben, I don't know if you're representative of the, of the broader community. <laughs> you know, I think if you, can, if you can make it easier to get the data in um, and use a tool, at least to start with, that people are familiar with, because that's the other thing we don't want, is that there's a whole brand new tool that someone has to learn and then teach other people to use. At least, you know, the idea of using the tool that we have, which is the IPT in whatever, you know, version six comes along, and having it at least work at that generalized level where we can get the data out. And if the people who are putting the data in are the people who are gonna be using it, then surely there's gonna be some synergy, right? And so you could start rather than trying to get the person who doesn't know what we have yet, take some people who know what Darwin Core is, who have some data and who are now saying, All right, I need to put it somewhere and try that first as your use case just to get it out there. If we don't know it's out there, we can't tell you what we want. Mm. Yeah, that's where, that's where the, the use case task team will help us. That'll, that'll help pick us up on how to get started. So I, I think I have a slightly different take on um, this, the issue that uh, Richard brought up because you know, I'm coming at it from, you know, I have data providers who want to provide their data and they want to follow the standard and basis of record is a required field with a controlled vocabulary. And so they have to use it and they have to pick one of those options. And they, and that we are trying to figure out when do you apply these different, and I don't know that this is for this group to figure out, but maybe it's for this group to define what exactly constitutes a machine observation and what does not so that that can be spread out to the community. But somewhere this conversation needs to happen because I, instead, I'm just having these conversations with data providers where we just yeah. make it up ourselves. <laughs> so, um, and then we go in and we have, you know, I have someone who went and looked at the way other people are doing it and they're doing it completely differently. So, um, I, I don't know, I, it's a slightly different, it's not the, the end user perspective, but the people trying to follow the standard perspective. Thanks. Yeah, well, I wonder if it even matters that much. Um, you, you know, if, is, is it just the case that, you know, as long as we've got something to distinguish these kinds of observations from these, um, is, 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 that's helpful. But then why is it required? <laughs> Why does it have a control because, vocabulary? Uh, because you need those guideposts. Okay. But like, who are the people who are distinguishing what they do with the data based on the basis of record? We want to figure out who they are and how to serve them. That's the story. 
don't know. Um, just from that, um, the, the end user perspective, I'm wondering, um, Anton, if I might be able to ask you uh, about that as the, uh, am, I, am I right in that the RATD um, and Antarctic projects are um, meta reviews or grouped, groupings of lots of different studies um, all together? Like there's a, there's a number of studies, um, say in marine and Antarctic, uh, space that have been done that are combinations of say uh, hundreds of tracking studies is 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 that a, a, a one of our end use cases where um, Darwin core helps bring together well, many data sets of different types well the big one that I was involved in the the reddit project that John also mentioned is that was basically people getting together for ten years and asking and begging people for access to the original data and then pushing that in the format and um, what we did is actually uh, we published what we call the standardized data and that data was filtered and it's basically the standardized data that we then in the end converted towards um, the GBIF standard and, and we've actually had discussions still going on, on on how to put it in the format going on on, on, on the github so that was really it. So we didn't initially use that uh, Darwin Core standard. It is born of an idea of how we can match it to the standard. Um, but I think that's also due to the fact that when we started with this 10, five, well, first, well, five years ago when we started working on the data, we didn't have any reference in GBIF of, of, of doing it in, in that way. So we sort of, as a community, uh, were learning um, along. Um, with how the process is going. Um, but yeah, I, th I think, well, it's things that have been mentioned here before. Eh? Um, I just had an email last week is, we have a new data set that could be added to the rapid catalog. Um, and people just want to have an easy way to put it in and make it sure that it has distributed as much as possible to MoveBank, um, GBIF and, and OBIS. But yeah, I don't think that, scientists use the, the Darwin core standard per se. And I think it's mostly for me, it's about a discovery tool where people can get access to the data and then if they dig deeper that they can find more information. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I want to uh, add to this. I think the community that we have here on this call, being this a TEDWIC conference is I think more familiar with the IPT and Darwin core and are not coming, I mean, are coming to this with that perspective. Like I've always tried mm -hmm. to map my data to, to Darwin core while the people that are not on this call are all these different communities that, for example, Sarah Davidson is, is serving like move bank users who are within their world and, and uh, know that type of data. And I think, it, yeah, it makes sense to, the community support that you have there is something we cannot offer as a bigger group. I think what we can offer here is how to make it more discoverable at uh, like a more generic biodiversity information level. Uh, so Sarah and um, Sharon, I think for example, the use case where you have like, oh, we would like to publish this, this data through the IPT because that is something we know. Um, yeah, th that was my initial reaction too when I had this uh, tracking data on my hand, but I think it's interesting to look if there's any more specific community and like the, see the data center that they're using there and also get the support because that's one of the things that I really like for the MoveBank, for example, to see, oh, finally, my data fits perfectly in the scheme and I can get support and feedback on how to, to map this rather than this group, bigger group here where, uh, yeah, we, we cannot offer this type of specific support. I mean that that's that's fair comment. Um, what would be great is if, as a as a group, Tadwig recommended that. You know, you want a clear recommendation on the Tadwig side. If that's what the group decides, that's fine. But I want to know when I get to Tadwig, which is my start point, where do I go and how do I navigate from there? Because it's yeah, it's not that obvious. So I think it's certainly recognizable of trying to fit in these machine observations into your IPT and at some point hitting 
a wall that's so big that you don't know where to go. <laughs> so uh, in our case, we, we have these triggers where the resulting image is empty because it's a false trigger or because the animal was too quickly. And yeah, I, I understand this is an absence record, but an absence of what? Do we, do we just list off everything we check for or everything our crowdsourcing platform checks for that would like multiply our data sets enormously? And I'm not sure how useful that would be because of course it's not a guarantee either. So we ended up pushing that data exclusively to Zenodo where it's not, not very findable, but at least it's somewhere. But uh, this is this is one of these examples of a question where you don't really know where to go, and uh, some some guidance would be very nice. So uh, my email address yeah. is in the Google Doc, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, so Peter, for that one specifically, I would say uh, the link that is in the chat, and I'll repost it for the camera trap package schemas. That is what we are planning to do, to publish our camera trap data that comes out of the software to Zenodo, but in that format. So uh, that all data that is in that format can then be uh, translated and, and harvested, but at least the, the full, I mean, the, the, the standard does capture the, the full breadth of the uh, camera trap data. So rather than, because if everybody's just going to publish their data as raw data, then yeah, we're going to have many different formats there and it's difficult to going to be able, be able to build something on top of that. Uh, but yeah, uh, it would be nice if you could have a look at that one and uh, it's an open issue tracker. Um, and it's welcome for suggestions. The other thing towards practicality is you if everyone has their own version, this is the whole point of a standard. If everybody wants their own little thing and I have to do was it you just said Zenodo and there's MoveBank and there's, there's like about five things that have just been thrown at me and I have to do it differently for every one of them. I'm going to do none of them because it's too, it's too hard, you know. Does anyone else, does anyone else have any other questions or comment, comments on uh, Camera Trap? I want to, to comment on as well oh, sorry. And on, 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 well, I, I think one of the key things, what, what's the usefulness of OBIS and GBIS is that you get uh, a layer of integration of information um, that you can compare and that you can uh, build insights from, from, from measurements that might come from very different sources. Um, so within a community, the standard that Darwin Core is might not be the perfect standard within that community, but I do think it's quite important that it allows interoperability between different communities. And that for me is the key. And that's um, why I still think it's relevant that it, that stuff gets into OBIS and into GBIF. Um, and yeah, I think at, at some level you can say, go to Zenodo for the very raw data or the fictionless data, um, but you need that translation into OBIS and GBIF so that there's an integration and the people that saw the, the presentation about the IPTs that the Peter Provost gave, if you then can build metrics on top of that, I think that's where you get powers in, in systems like GBV and Opus that you can integrate that. Um, and so that, that, there's different levels of, of um, operationality that, that, that we need to observe. And um, yeah. Yeah, no, cool, thank you. Uh, uh, can I just ask, um, uh, Tim, you were telling me a little while ago that um, GBIF and OBIS signed uh, an agreement or re-signed an agreement just recently. Um, how does that work? What, uh, marine data always goes to OBIS and terrestrial to GBIF, how does it work? You, you asked me. Um, oh, I don't know who to ask. <laughs> but I don't know if there's obvious people on the call who may know more about the details. I just um, put a link in the chat. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, it's an obvious thing. Um, it, I think there's, a, there's an agreement that what we want to do is make sure all the data, um, the common data model, the Darwin core stuff is shared in both. Um, whereas OBIS provide much more specialized services than GBIF do from marine data, but the actual occurrence records that are openly licensed would also be in GBIF. 
And the same is true for data mobilization activities through GBIF, where there is data that should be included in the OBIS portal, they will be. And then there's a bunch of um, sort of uh, commitments to outreach and engagement and training um, alignment so that we're all talking about the same thing and, um, and working together. Well, in terms of data exchange, I would expect the occurrence records to be available in both systems. Mm. That's my understanding. I must admit I haven't been involved in it though. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, John and Abby, is that? Yes, that's, yeah, that's, that's the idea is that, um, you know, so when I uh, mobilize a data set, I share it with both OBIS and GBIF. Um, and I've been doing that long before I even became node manager for GBIF. So um, yeah, that's sort of the idea is to try to share to both and. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I've, I've adopted a little problem where we have um, OBIS ALA as well as a as a third as a third um, place where the data goes and some goes from OBIS to GBIF to ALA and back around and we get a bit lost sometimes but we're fixing that up. I, I think the solution there and I want to wait till they get so Tim might hear it is I think if we can have communities and we have can assign a data set to, to different publishers that would solve a lot of issues we have it with the SCAR community. There's, there's the countries that want to publish the data sets and they actually, the Australian data sets go into ALA as well. Um, and they go through us in, in OBIS and it, it creates uh, difficulties. And if we would be able to just say, this belongs to these communities or these publishers are uh, co-responsible for these data sets, then uh, that would be a great help. And I think a lot of issues between OBIS and GB in, in that sense would be solved as well. This is, so some of the issues we've had have been rather silly. We just never got around to getting them fixed. It's things like a, a consistent citation format that GBIF applied that wasn't acceptable to some of the, the OBIS community for good reason. Um, and we, we've now got on top of those issues. Um, there was a great presentation in the, the IPT. So there was two great presentations in the IPT session today, one from Peter Desmet and one from uh, Pieter Provoust um, on the OBIS experience. And uh, it, it was really about accreditation and community aspects of where these data are coming from and giving, giving proper uh, notifications and credit to the people involved. And we've, got, we've still got some work to do in that to make it slicker. Thanks for that. Okay, we're coming up to 10 minutes um, from the end and I feel like it's probably time to start wrapping up. Uh, does, does anyone have, um, do we have, I haven't been keeping an eye on the document, do we have any outstanding questions that we haven't covered off here? That anyone's aware of? No, I think we did well. No, that's, that's really good. Uh, I think I'll be going through and reviewing um, uh, the recording of this session. I think um, I could make out about three different um, conversations that need to come out uh, of this session. Um, and so we'll follow those up. Uh, if anyone would like to keep in touch with the group, I've put my email address in the um, in the document and um, please do get in touch. Does uh, uh, anyone have any, any final comments? Perhaps I can go around the room um, and just ask for some final comments. Peter, uh, starting with you. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. I think this was a very active session. Uh, we didn't lose many participants. It stayed at 36 or throughout most of the call. I would say, uh, since a lot of things were discussed and ideas for task groups, what I would suggest, uh, I mean, we do have some email addresses, but if you keep watch on the Darwin Core for Biologging repository, uh, I think we'll post, uh, that's where most of the activity will happen. So if you watch that repository, you'll be updated of uh, new things uh, and we might post things there too uh, for more specific use cases. Thanks, Peter.
John, any closing comments? Just always thrilled to be involved and to, to have a bunch of folks like this bending their uh, minds to the problems I have every day. So thank you so much for keeping on welcoming me back. Cool. Thanks, John. Sarah. Well, thanks everybody for joining. I know for some people it is strange times of the day. Um, this, uh, yeah, this, I, I think we got some cool ideas out of this, some kind of specific steps forward. Um, and yeah, thanks everybody. And yeah, I definitely encourage people to uh, send, uh, send their emails to Peggy and um, we can keep in touch. Cool, thank you. Uh, Abby. Um, I think it's been a great session. I think we have some uh, some action items to go forward. I'm looking forward to trying to do the camera trap um, examples. So um, count me in on that and uh, look forward to more to come. Cool, thanks Abby. Holger? No, thanks. It was a very, it was a very interesting session, uh, and I'm I'm really happy that we actually now have a lot of camera trapping in this in this interest group. When we started the interest group, it was very much about uh, biologging uh, tracking, but now I think we are really getting somewhere that we that we actually get in all the people involved in any type any type of machine observations into this group. This is really good. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Holger. Uh, and uh, I'll just ask some of the more active participants. Ben, have you got anything you'd like to add? I, I do not. I, I think this is okay. good. I like this. No, <laughs> this that's is, fine. Really nice people. This is really good. So. Careful, awesome. it's habit forming. <laughs> <laughs> and Sharon? Um, yeah, no, I, like I said, I, we're new to this kind of data set at the Field Museum, but we have a lot of it. So if if we can be of help with use cases and like I said in the chat, Michelle's happy to throw her data set out there for you guys to help us with. A little selfishly means it'll get our data working, but um, yeah, we'd love to be involved with that. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for coming and contributing. Um, there's several museums in Australia working with this sort of data as well. And Anton, any closing comments? Yeah, no, uh, I think it was a, a great uh, session. A uh, lot of interaction and uh, like others said, um, I think with the Antarctic community, we're happy to contribute with, with use cases, so. Lovely, thank you. And Tim? Just say thank you very much, Peggy. It was a wonderful session. Um, do you plan to do anything in the October Tadwick? Um, week of sessions? No. <laughs> no, I'm completely inundated and had no, uh, uh, yeah, I was just scraping through with this meeting, to be honest. Um, there's some interesting sessions on, but, um, but yeah, we didn't um, opt to run a symposium this year. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I think with that, we'll, um, We'll close up. Um, thanks everyone for coming at various times of the day and uh, in, a, in these uh, fairly challenging times. Um, all the best with um, whatever your local situation is with the current pandemic and crisis. Um, I will endeavour to uh, go through the recording and get some notes and send them out uh, to those of you who have um, expressed interest in being contacted. I think we've got a few sessions um, that uh, really do need to get moving uh, that we've discussed today. And uh, it's, look, perhaps we can get that green line to go up in my charts next year. Thanks very, mu thanks very much, everyone. Let's close up and... Uh, See you all at the IPT session. Thanks, Peggy. Bye, everyone. Okay, bye now. Bye. Peter.